For those who don't know us, we pay for transportation for disadvantaged children from schools or groups to attend education programs at the preserve. We support student science interns throughout the year. We support science projects for the staff. And we will be announcing a special project for 2020 in the coming months, so keep, keep checking into the website. We are grateful for the help that many of you have already provided and invite anyone else to click the donation link for $5 to anyone who feels like doing so, and that will pop up at the end of the program. Finally, visit the Preserve's website at albanypinebush.org. There are other activities there, such as our 20 mile trail challenge, and you can download that and enjoy all 20 miles of the, of the Preserve. So with that, I wanna thank you again for being here and turn the mic over to Amanda, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you so much, Richard. I really appreciate it. And thanks for all the great work that the friends are doing. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Dylan. I'm the field ecologist and entomologist with the Albany Pine Bush Preserve Commission. Um, and I facilitate our science lecture series. I'm used to being in a classroom with a lot of people. So this is different. Um, I really appreciate everybody um, logging in to, to see our science lecture in a different format. Um, and um, a very special thank you to our speaker, um, Julie Hart, um, for her willingness to change the format of her lecture this year. Um, so um, I just wanted to go over a little bit. If anybody's unfamiliar with Zoom, you'll notice that you're all muted. <laughs> so if you have any questions that you'd like to pose to Julie, um, you can pose them. If you scroll to the bottom, a kind of bar pops up and you can um, click on Q&A to ask questions. I will keep track of those questions um, and we will ask them of Julie at the end of the lecture um, just to kind of streamline things. So if you ask a question, it's not getting answered right away. That's why. If you have a technical question um, that I can address, I'll respond to you um, if you're having some kind of technical issues. Um, so with that, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, um, Julie Hart. Um, Julie is a native Vermonter who started birding while working as a bird conservation intern with National Audubon, Audubon, New York, and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. She traveled for several years doing field work around the globe before returning to Vermont to serve as the coordinator for Mountain Bird Watch with the Vermont Center for Ecosystem Eco Studies. She spent several years chasing Bicknell's thrush around the mountains of the Northeast and Hispaniola before moving to Wyoming to continue her education. She received her master's degree studying the impacts of climate change on Cassia Crossville in southern Idaho. After spending several years abroad, she is now settled in the Albany area, where she is the project coordinator for the third breeding bird atlas in New York. In her travels, she has participated in two bird atlases and considers atlasing her favorite type of birding. So thank you, thank you so much, Julie. Um, really looking forward to your talk tonight. Thank you so much, that was really nice. Um, yeah, and, and I will say that hopefully um, by the end of this lecture, you will all sense um, how much I do enjoy atlasing um, and why, why it is one of my favorite type of birding. Um, so with that, I do want to start um, jumping right into my lecture. So I'm going to be talking tonight about the joys of atlasing. Uh oh, there you go. All right. Um, so I wanted to start off um, for those of you that might not be familiar with the breeding bird atlas and, and just explain a little bit about what an atlas is. Um, so here I have a map, which this is one of the project products from the, the second breeding bird atlas that we conducted in New York in the early 2000s. And this is a map for the distribution of osprey across the state. Um, and you'll see that the state um, is broken up into little purple grids, a little purple grid system. Um, and what we do is we break the entire state up into small blocks. And then in those blocks, uh, volunteers will go out and document all the different birds that they see breeding within each of those blocks. Um, and so this is the data for all the blocks in the state where Osprey was attempting to breed. And you'll see like that they're, you know, as we expect, they're really common on Long Island. 
um, and then throughout central New York, but they're also really common on the lakes in the Adirondacks as well. Um, so this is the, the type of really interesting um, information that we get out of a breeding bird atlas. Um, and that's, for me, one of the really interesting um, and exciting parts of alicing. Um, and that is that you really get a, a much um, keener awareness of exactly where birds are living and where they're distributed across the state. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the second atlas. Um, so the second atlas um, was conducted from 2000 to 2005. The first atlas was from 1980 to 1985. Um, so we basically do every 20 years, we do a new breeding bird atlas in the state. Um, and then in the second breeding bird atlas, we documented almost 250 species breeding in the state. And because we had done two atlases, we could look and see how much the distributions of those species had changed in that interim time period. And about a quarter of those species had expanded their range and about a quarter had their range had shrunk. Um, on top of that, we were able to see things like that we lost um, canvas back and loggerhead shrike as breeders in the state. Um, they were never very common in New York, um, but they have been documented breeding in the near past in, you know, in the 1980 atlas, the first atlas, um, but we were not able to confirm them as breeding in the second atlas. On the flip side, we had six species that were new to the state that had moved in to New York in that 20 year interval. Um, so we had trumpeter swans, common eiders, black vultures, merlin, sandhill crane, and Wilson's phalarope breeding in the state for the first time. So in the third atlas, um, we started that on January 1st, 2020. And we have already seen a ton of data coming in from atlasers all across the state. Um, people are super excited about this project and, and participating. Um, we've already had over 800 people submitting just about 25,000 checklists. And, and that was actually from early this morning. So it's, it's very well over 25,000 by now. And 65 of those species have already been confirmed breeding in the state. And what I did here was I listed some of the um, species that are most commonly um, documented already. Um, so by far, Canada geese have been documented all across the state. They're, they're by far the most numerous. Um, and then the osprey and bald eagle are rapidly expanding right now as well. Red-tailed hawks, crows, and of course, starlings and house sparrows um, are quite numerous. And now that we're hitting spring and the migrants are coming back, um, with a, the number of species that are going to be breeding is going to rapidly increase. And we're gonna see those numbers uh, skyrocket really quickly. So why do we do an atlas? So on top of getting that distribution information, um, it really allows us to help us, give us an idea for how to manage populations. Um, so, you know, whether it's a game bird or non-game bird, um, it gives us really important information as to their status in the state and if more work needs to be done to manage those populations. We also can answer a lot of interesting scientific changes or uh, scientific research questions. So um, from the second, comparing the first to the second atlas, um, there was, you know, a couple of research papers that came out in journals, and one of those looked at climate change and how the, the range of about half of our bird species has already shifted northward about three kilometers. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, well now, once we finish this third atlas, we'll see even more changes from climate change. The information is actually really critical as well for helping to site you know, wind and solar farms across the state. So it's a really strong um, piece of support uh, for siting um, development projects across the state. It's also a really great way to promote nature appreciation and engage the general public in science and, and help all of you guys um, become more aware of your surroundings and, and gain a greater appreciation for nature. 
And then um, I've already hinted at this some, but it, it does allow us to monitor changes in the population. So I'll just provide a couple of examples. Um, so here is the change map for redheaded woodpecker. So what this map is showing is the change that was documented between that first atlas in the 80s and the second atlas in the 2000s. So on this map, the, the purple squares, which you can hardly make out, but there are a few scattered there. Those are places where the redheaded woodpecker gained ground. So it expanded its range in, in that 20 year period. The green squares are, which are mostly in the center of the big orange blobs, are where they were found consistently in both atlases. So that's where it stayed the same. And then all those orange squares, which is the majority of the map, shows where um, redheaded woodpecker are no longer occurring. Um, so that's where their distribution has really, um, really shrunk in those 20 years. And um, this has been really, really important information for um, identifying this species as something that the state really needs to pay more attention to um, and try to come up with a conservation plan for it and, um, and try to figure out what's going on. This is a species that we knew was declining and it's declining all across the Northeast and it's really kind of unknown at this point as to why that is, um, but this helped to document that change. On the flip side, we have other species um, that are increasing in the state. So normally I have this as a quiz and I ask the audience what the species is and then, um, and then I ask people when they think that they first started nesting in the state. And most people don't realize that uh, Merlin were not found in the state in the 1980s. And now you can pretty much find them everywhere. Um, but they didn't start nesting. The first nest was just wasn't discovered until 1992. So fairly recently. So this is actually the map of where Merlin were documented in the second atlas so in that 2000 atlas. And you can see that it's really mostly just the Adirondacks. So this is actually a species that is increasing its range, expanding its range from the north. It's coming from Canada and moving south across the state. And so I was kind of curious, you know, to try to get a sneak peek of what the results of this third Alice might show. Um, so I looked at the eBird data for the last few years um, for the months where Merlin are breeding. And I plotted that over top of here. And you can see the purple is where this species has been documented in the, the recent past in the state. So it's basically completely taken over all of New York State. It's already down on Long Island. It's already expanding into Pennsylvania. And, and so this is a species that we'll be able to document some really um, impressive gains in the state. And uh, the black vulture is a very similar example where they have also taken over, um, spread across much of, this, much of the state as well. Um, but they're one that's actually expanding from the south and moving north. So having said that, I, I think that one of the main goals of the Atlas is to provide really critical information for conservation. Um, and that's something that really um, drives my motivation to participate in a project like this because it provides such critical information. And so I work, um, I work with New York Natural Heritage Program, but my office is actually in the DC central office here in Albany. And um, when I walk around all the wildlife staff, they all have the breeding bird atlas on their desk. They're all like constantly referring to it. It's like the Bible in terms of the status of birds in the state. So I can see like firsthand how much people rely on the data to do their job, to, to help guide conservation and, and planning in the state. So this time around, we have involved um, all of the major bird conservation organizations that are based in the state. Um, so like I said, I, I work with New York Natural Heritage Program. 
Um, we have representatives on the steering committee from the State Department of Environmental Conservation as well. Um, we have uh, representatives from the Cornell Cooperative Research Station, which is part of USDS, uh, the State Ornithological Association, SUNY ESF, uh, Audubon New York, and then of course eBird, um, which I'll talk about more later. They are where we're entering data. That's our data entry system is through eBird. So we have representatives from all the conservation organizations involved in the project. And then really briefly, the organization of the project um, is such that we've tried to um, have representation, not just from different organizations, different perspectives, um, but also from different geographic areas. And so on this map, you can kind of see where uh, members of the steering committee and the subcommittees are located. Um, you can see that I am the little orange bird in, and I'm based in the Albany area. And then um, I work with a whole team of regional coordinators and they're really the people that are on the ground and working directly with volunteers. And they're like the resource for um, answering questions. So if you end up um, participating in this project, um, it's, it's really valuable to know who, who your regional coordinator is and, and how to contact them and, and ask them your questions. Um, and then, of course, in green, we have all of the observers who are participating in the atlas. And we really do have people already from, from all over the state. Um, and I'll show you a, a map of, of where people um, are submitting data from in a little bit. So I'm going to move into how to atlas. And I think this is the most fun and rewarding part of, of the project. And um, not just for me, but for most people, we get into this because we enjoy watching birds. And I do feel like, um, so atlasing is really a type of birding, but I think it is a, is a slightly different spin than your normal birding. Because instead of trying to find as many species as you can within an area, or counting how many individuals of each species you're finding. Um, what you're really trying to do here is you're watching individuals and watching their behaviors and trying to determine if they are breeding in that area. So it really forces you to slow down and really get to know their behaviors, their habits, you know, why they're in this shrub and not that shrub, um, things like that. So, so it's, it's really fun to, to learn a lot more in depth about their natural history. So here's just a few examples. So starting in the top left, um, this is a bobolink, and you can see that the bill is full of grubs, and that um, bobolink is carrying food. So that is one of the, the breeding behaviors that we ask people to, to document. Um, and it's probably carrying its food, carrying food either to its mate who's sitting on the nest or to its young and feeding the young. And then in the top right, uh, this is a, actually a big nose thrush, um, which is obviously one of the species that I've studied before. So it's one of my favorites. Um, but here is a picture of it singing. And this is a really amazing picture because you basically never see them. Um, and so you'd be really lucky to, to document the species. But the singing does, does signal that, that they're on territory and they are defending it. And so they are probably at least trying to breed in that area. And then you have mute swan with babies. So a lot of waterfowl are, are fairly easy to document. They make it pretty obvious for us and help us out because they have their whole line of babies around them. So it's really easy to, to know that they bred on a certain body of water. Other species are a little bit harder to find. So this is actually a yellow warbler. You know, when they're singing, um, it's really easy to, to find them. They kind of stand out. They're on the top of a, of a small tree or a shrub and they're singing their heart out. 
but when they're actually like nesting, they can be a little bit harder to find. Um, and so this is a bird that's on the nest and you can tell that it's incubating because it's huddled way down. You can barely see the head peeking over the edge. Um, so this is another type of, of breeding behavior that, that we look for. So this is um, probably my greatest joy of atlasing. And that's really that you get to have this really intimate experience looking into the lives of these birds. Um, I usually visit, you know, the same place several times throughout the season. And when I do that, you know, each time I'm kind of creating this little 3D map in my head of where there's a catbird over here, um, there's a cardinal over there, and the robin over there. And then the next time I go, I'll check on them and I'll see how they're progressing through their breeding cycle. Um, and they're kind of like, you know, my birds and I check, they're like, you know, I can keep tabs of them and, and, uh, and it just gives me a lot of pleasure to, to see them succeed in their nesting attempts. Um, so, so yeah, that is um, my greatest joy with atlasing. Very rewarding. Um, and then what do you do with that, with those information, um, with that data? Uh, what we um, are asking people to do this time around is to enter their observations into eBird. So there's uh, a couple of different ways to enter eBird. So eBird is a free um, platform where you can um, enter all of your bird sightings. And you can do that either through the mobile app um, on Android or iOS, or you can enter your data directly online. And it's fairly easy to do either method. Uh, I think it's quicker with a mobile, with the mobile device. Um, for me, it's much easier. Um, but you can still do either either way you prefer. And these are some of the reasons why we're using eBird this time around. Um, so I said before that I would show you a map of, of where people are already participating in the state, where they're submitting data from. And this is um, one representation of that. And so this is a map from our Atlas website that shows you how many hours people have already spent uh, surveying for the Atlas in the different blocks across the state. So the darker the color is, those, those darker blues indicate that people have spent tens of hours in those areas. So of course you can see a lot of the city hotspots. So Albany, Ithaca, uh, Rochester, down in New York City, they're all blue because there's so many people there and they're you know, a lot of hardcore birders and they're going out and atlasing. Other areas um, don't have any effort spent there yet. Um, and you can kind of tell where there's a lot lower population density. And uh, I think um, some of those areas will get filled in um, as the season progresses, as people um, go birding more, as people learn about the Atlas, um, and as the, the project continues throughout the five year window. And then I wanted to show you how, um, if you zoom in on that map, you can actually check the data for each individual square. Um, so I zoomed into Albany here and specifically to uh, one of the blocks that covers part of the Albany pine bush. Um, so this is the Albany Northwest block. And there have already been over 70 hours spent during the daytime in that block and uh, like one and a half hours at night already. Um, so that's, you get this a little bit of summary information here. And then if you click on that view all block data, you can get this really detailed page of all the species that have been documented so far in that block. Um, so here you can see um, that you can see the number of hours up there on the top. You can see that there's been 99 checklists submitted by six different atlasers already. You can see then below that you can see the um, most recent species that have been documented in the block. 
So you can see that um, Flickr was heard singing. There's a pair of titmice that were documented. Um, there's been rough winged swallows, ruby crowned kinglets, hermit thrush have been documented. And you can also see where, they, where those observations were taken as well as when and by whom. So it gives you a ton of information in real time that is just like really accessible to anyone um, and can really help guide you the next time that you go out birding. You can, you can go to this type of page to our website and see what you're, you know, figure out what you're going to expect, what you would expect to see in that block and kind of hone in on, on what you want to see. You can also search the database by species as well. So you remember on that first spot slide that I said, um, Canada goose is by far the most commonly documented breeding species so far. Um, and this is the map from earlier today for Canada goose. And you can see that all the really dark purple, it almost appears black on the screen. Um, but those really dark purples are where it's been documented or uh, confirmed nesting. I think most of those are birds that are already sitting on their nests. Um, and you can see that they're all across the state um, within their habitat, um, all the way up Lake Champlain in the St. Lawrence Valley, all the way out on Lake Ontario. And then all of this information that we collect goes into the eBird as well. And eBird is a global portal for storing bird observation data. And they have a number of scientists and statisticians on their team who use all of the data that's collected by everyone across the globe and incorporate that into these really amazing outputs. So here we have an animation of American kestrel migration throughout the year. So you can see really clearly um, when they move north, when they move back south, and the color gives you an indication of how, how many individuals there are at that particular location. So you can see how dense the population is So that's, uh, for me, that's also really satisfying to know that you're contributing data to a really big a global citizen science project. So I wanna talk a little bit more about blocks um, in, case, in case you do find yourself wanting to participate in the Atlas. Um, so there's 5,700 blocks across the state and the way that they are labeled uh, is based on the USGS topo quad system. So each topo quad is split up into six equal areas. And then each of those are named according to their uh, location within that quad. So for Albany, you have the, the Northwest quad, the Northeast, the center west and the center east, southwest and southeast. And each of those squares is about three by three miles. And um, what we ask people to do, as I mentioned in the beginning, is to try to keep their observations from within a block. And so what we've done is we have made all kinds of maps for each individual block that you can download from our website. Oops, I went the wrong way. There we go. And one of the things that we're trying to do by having all these blocks and, and breaking the state up is, is trying to spread the effort out across the state. Uh, so on this map, you can see how many species were documented in each of those atlas blocks in the 2000 atlas. And this gives you some idea of species richness. So the really dark squares indicate that there are over a hundred species that were documented as attempting to breed in that block. And you can see a lot of the dark areas occurs in that central 
and western part of the state that has a lot more habitat diversity. And then you can see areas like the Adirondacks and also around New York City and, and parts of Long Island, where there's a lot lower species diversity. So it shows us some really interesting patterns, but the reason why I'm showing that to you is because if you look behind that map, what you'll see is the number of hours that people spent in each of those blocks. And so on this map, you can see that there are some areas that got a lot of coverage and other areas that didn't get so much. So you can see Steuben County down here, St. Lawrence County, Franklin County, even parts of Saratoga County um, got very little coverage. So one of the things that we're really striving for in this Atlas is to make sure that we get a really consistent um, level of effort across the entire state. And we want that to be spaced out a little bit more evenly. So what we've done is here's the same uh, map that I showed you before. And what we've done is we've selected priority blocks. And those are the blocks that I've highlighted in green. So the Northwest and the Center East blocks in each of the topo quads are selected as priorities. And what that means is that we want people who have an option of where they can go birding to, to head to those areas first. But that's not to say that if you, so I, for example, don't live in a priority block, but I'm still birding, I'm still atlasing in my block. Um, and that's fine. Um, all of that information is still really valuable. Um, but our goal overall for the five years is to make sure that at least those green squares, those priority blocks um, get covered. So one of the things that this will force us to do, if you recall that, that map I just showed you with the effort and all the little um, white areas where there was very little effort, is hopefully um, it will force us to, to go to places that we wouldn't normally go. Um, places that maybe aren't known already to be hot spots or, you know, great birding locations, but maybe they'll become our new favorite place to go birding. Um, so I, I know that from my past experiences atlasing um, that I've discovered some really cool little, little places um, on the Connecticut coast and up in northeastern Vermont where, um, yeah, they were kind of off the birder radar, um, but but they were really great places to go. So within each of those blocks, um, for those of you that, that maybe aren't familiar with eBird and the way that data is collected through eBird, what you do is when you go to a particular location, you write a checklist for that lo specific location. So, if I'm looking at this block, say this is um, the block near my house. I, oops. Oh, I don't know what I just did. <laughs> Somehow jumped to the end of my presentation. It's funny. Okay. Um, so say this is the block where I live and I wanna make sure that I am trying to get a good cross section of all the species that that breed in my blocks. So I look at it and identify different habitat types. You know, one morning I might decide I want to go to visit the shrubs, the like shrubby early successional or transitional areas in the block. So I would submit one checklist for that area. And by a checklist, I just mean the list of species and the breeding behavior that you observed for each species. And then you might go to um, this, the next day, maybe you decide to go to the wetlands or the open water down in the other corner of your block. And so you would submit another checklist. And you would do that and have multiple checklists all across your, your block or a block, I should say. Um, and then while you're birding, um, we do ask that you try to keep track of where you are located within or in relation to the block boundaries. Um, and if you're going to leave a block that you would stop your checklist and create a new one for the other block. And that's pretty easy to do now if you're using the mobile app. 
um, the mobile app has the, the block boundaries in the app. So you can see that while you're in the field, you can see where you're standing and see where the block boundary is. So that's really useful. Otherwise, you would have to refer to um, some other digital maps or um, a paper map. The other thing that we do request is that you try to keep your checklist on the shorter side of things. Um, and the reason for that is that we really, you know, one of our other goals for the project is to really look at habitat associations for all these species. And so the shorter the checklist is, the easier we are to relate that to the habitat that there is on the ground. So generally that's um, five miles or less. Um, and then even shorter than that is better. So in terms of entering data, um, as I mentioned before, you can enter data on the website. Um, if you use the website, then you do have to type in ebird.org and then slash Atlas NY. And that will take you to our website and there's a submit button there and anything you submit to that, if you already have an eBird account, um, it all gets duplicated or not, I shouldn't say duplicated. It gets connected and linked to your account. Um, so it'll show up in your My eBird account, um, but it, by entering it on this website, it will also show up on our Atlas maps that I showed you before. So you need to make sure that you use that, that portal and you have to type in that URL. And then if you're in the using the mobile app, um, then it's the same thing where you have to make sure you use the Atlas portal. And to do that, you have to go into the settings of the app and select the New York Breeding Bird Atlas portal. And I do have some tutorials, um, video tutorials of how to do that on our website. So here's an example of an actual checklist. Um, I, I made this checklist up and um, I put in a bunch of you know, common backyard birds and I entered um, the different habitat, uh, sorry, the different uh, breeding behavior codes um, for each of the species if I observed something. And the app will show you the actual code that you submitted for each species. And, you know, a lot of times you'll start out birding, you know, if you're in a place where there's catbirds, um, you'll probably hear them singing right away as soon as you get out of the car. And, you know, singing is one of the breeding codes that indicates that they're there, they're on territory. But then as you go around and, and walk around the trails a bit more, you're probably gonna run into one that's doing something, you know, carrying nesting material or even carrying food. And so every time you, you go out um, birding, you would submit for each species the highest code, like the strongest code that you observe for that species. So eBird only allows you to enter one code per species. So we ask you to do the, the highest code, um, the highest code being the one furthest down the list. So this list basically goes from the, the least or the weakest evidence to the strongest evidence of breeding. So from, from being in the right habitat to nest with young. So that's about it. You just enter your species, the number of individuals, and then your breeding code, um, and, then, and then submit your checklist um, to the portal and you're all set. Uh, so I did mention that we have um, you know, all those priority blocks that we want to survey across the state. You, know, you could end up surveying a, a single block for five years and put in hundreds and hundreds of hours and still not confirm all of the birds that are breeding in that block. So to prevent people from wasting their effort, um, we do have a set of uh, block com completion guidelines and that's kind of put in place to, to try to indicate when you've put in a sufficient amount of effort or an adequate amount of effort and you can move on to the next area so that you're, you're being more efficient in your surveys. So we use this whole suite of guidelines together 
And this is a, a total for the whole five year project. So it's not for each year. And we do ask people to hit all the different habitats and that's because within a block and that's because we do wanna get a good sample of all the different species that might be present. We also want people to survey throughout the breeding season. You know, some birds are breeding in March, some are breeding in January even, um, and some are breeding as late as, as into August. So we do want people to hit those early and late nesters as well as the, the core part of the breeding season in June and July. And then we do have a minimum threshold for a number of hours spent during the day and at night. And then this is one is a little bit more complicated where we have the number of species per block. Um, the state of New York is really variable in terms of bird diversity across the state. And so depending on where you are, the number of species you can expect to find in your block um, is quite variable. So if you're on Long Island, you might, might shoot for 55, 60 species. But if you're in central New York, um, you're gonna be more like 90 to 100 species. So that's a, a general guideline there. Um, and then of those species that you find, we do want half of them to be confirmed breeding. It's something I didn't talk about too much, but there's different levels of breeding. And so we have possible breeders, probable breeders, and confirmed breeders. Um, and so we want 50% of species to be confirmed. And those are things like carrying nesting material, building a nest, a nest with young, nest with eggs, fledglings, you know, really strong documentation that, that they're actually birding in that area, that they're breeding in that area. So this is something, you know, I started this job a year ago and um, when I moved to Albany, I, I paid attention to the local listservs and birding listservs. And there were a lot of people that were complaining that it was boring in the summer. There was nothing to do. It was hot. There were no exciting birds around. And all I could think was, wait, there's so many cool things going on right now. Like there's so many like really interesting behaviors that you can see. You can watch them feeding their young. You can try to guess at what all these these funny looking little fledglings, like what species are they? You know, half the time you can't tell when they're really young and it's just, they just look hilarious. And so I was like, no, no, there's no summer doldrums because there's so much going on. Um, and now this year, like, you know, the Atlas is going and uh, I think it will help keep people entertained a bit more um, this year. There will be more to do throughout the, the slower summer months. So one of the concerns that I hear a lot about using eBird, some people are reluctant to use eBird because uh, they're afraid that they, if they enter an observation of a species that somebody might go and harass that bird or um, steal eggs from the nest if it's a, if it's a raptor, a falcon, um, or otherwise cause it to abandon its nest. Um, so we did get together a small team of us um, from DC, from Heritage, from eBird, and we discussed what the most sensitive species are to disturbance. And so for these species that you see here, um, we do hide the information for those species during their breeding seasons. So um, starting in the top left, that's a short-eared owl, and then below is, is spruce grouse golden eagle, and then the middle column is black rail, northern goshawk, and king rail. And then the top right is a barn owl, loggerhead shrike, and long-eared owl. So there still might be additional um, sensitive species, depending on where you're located in the state, um, that, that don't occur on this list. And for that, there are some other ways that you can protect the data if you're really concerned about it. Um, and I do have a list of those available on the website. So if you're new, totally new to eBird, um, there is a free online course that will, will get you going and that's offered through the Cornell Labs Bird Academy. It's called eBird Essentials. 
I do recommend that. Um, it doesn't go into how to add the breeding codes, um, but that is fairly easy to figure out. And um, I do have some uh, video tutorials on the website as well that will help you do that. Uh, normally I would be doing lots of training workshops across the state, but of course all the in-person trainings are on hold right now. Um, so I am working on putting together some additional web tutorials that will help people with some of these details. And then um, again, you know, in a normal year, um, we would be able to help pair people up with more experienced birders, with experienced atlasers, um, and try to spread that knowledge of how to atlas effectively. And then I do want to uh, emphasize that everyone can participate in this project as long as you have an interest in birds. Um, even if you are a um, strictly stay at home backyard birder, um, that's fine. That's, we still need that information as well. Um, there's a lot of people that um, don't have access to residential areas. Um, and so having that type of information um, entered is really valuable. And then other people might be heading more interested in going to more wilderness areas. And so we do need all different types of data. And it really is as simple as visiting a block and observing the bird behaviors and then just entering the data in eBird. And it should say too that I am working on a bunch of materials right now to help people learn how to, um, sorry, I'm getting, there's some chats coming through here. Um, I am working on some materials to help people identify the birds that are breeding in their backyards because there are some people that can't travel very far. Um, there's curfews put in place. There's, um, you know, different people have different restrictions across the state. So um, depending on where you are, um, kind of determines how much you can travel at this moment. So if all you can do is get out in, in your neighborhood or in your backyard, then, then that's still valuable to you. And this is normally one of my joys of atlasing. Um, this year is a bit harder, um, but uh, hopefully next year um, we'll be able to allow um, more opportunities for people to get together, to meet fellow atlasers, um, to hold um, trainings, to hold blockbusting events where we spend the whole weekend really trying to target those areas where there's no birders and fill in those gaps. Um, and holding, you know, appreciation events and things like that. So, um, so keep an eye out for those types of events coming up once, um, once we have a handle on coronavirus. And in the meantime, I've started hosting uh, town hall meetings. Um, so that's something I just held the first one earlier this week. And it was really great. We had about uh, 125 people from all across the state. And um, yeah, and we'll be holding another one. I don't have a date yet, but we will be holding another one. So I mentioned before, this is our website where you enter data. It also has all of the information about the project. Um, so you can find much more information about all the things that I've been talking about. We do have a lot of uh, different resources available uh, for people who are new to maybe the whole breeding um, behaviors for all the different species that breed here. And uh, one of them is this here was a breeding timeline chart. So for each of the species that are listed on the left and then on the, the top, you have the different months broken up into four different weeks. And then it indicates whether that's a non-breeding part of their year or the breeding part or migration. Um, so it kind of gives you some sense of what species are breeding when. There are also a lot of other resources out there if you're um, new to birding or you want to ex expand your um, knowledge about behaviors or life history or you want to get better at uh, song identification, 
Um, there are a lot of apps out there and websites and um, the ones that I have listed here. Um, I also have them all listed on the links page on our website and uh, I've used all of them personally so um, I can recommend them. They are uh, extremely helpful. Uh, Merlin is fully integrated into eBird. Um, so if you have both apps on your phone, you can easily switch back and forth between the two. And Merlin has sound information, has ID information, it has range map information and all of that. Um, so that's pretty helpful if you have, if you want to have those two apps working together. So if you're excited to participate in the project, then the things that I would recommend are to visit the website um, and check out the information on there. Sign up for our newsletter, which goes out every month. Um, check out the handbook. You can follow us on social media. Um, we have you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those. Um, then the best part about it all is to go atlasing and submit your data on eBird and have fun. So I just wanted to recapitulate all of the, the joys of Alicing that I've mentioned so far. Um, and those are to learn where birds live, to contribute data for bird conservation, to get an intimate look into the lives of birds, to be part of something really big, uh, to explore new places, to not have summer doldrums, to discover new friends. And then lastly, hopefully you will come away enjoying a new way of birding. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, but before we jump to questions, I just wanted to point out that um, here I have uh, the link to the website as well as the email address if you wanted to get a hold of me. Um, I have the social media handles. We also do have a YouTube channel that I'm, I'm just starting to add a bunch of web tutorials to and also archiving some of the webinars and talks that I've been giving. We do have a store, an online store um, through Zazzle where you can get all kinds of Atlas gear if you wanted to get a hat or a shirt or something like that. And we do accept donations through PayPal as well. So with that, um, Maybe Amanda, you can, I'm sorry, Dylan, <laughs> you can, <laughs> sorry, you can uh, help me, <laughs> uh, yeah, shoot some questions at me. All right. Thank you so much, Julie. That was awesome. Um, so we do have a few questions and guys, feel free to, um, to type in questions. Um, so Richard wants to know, um, does the app work with GPS? Yes. It works both. Um, so um, there's two different parts, two different parts of the app. So one is tracking your location. And in order to do that, it does need access to your GPS on your phone. And then the other part is when you go to submit your data, um, you, can, you can do that in the field and it will use your data connection, your cell connection, or if you wait until you get home, you can do it on your Wi-Fi. So it, there is, it is possible to use it totally offline and without GPS as well. Awesome. Okay, um, Ellen is wondering if observations at backyard bird feeders are accepted. Yes, I would say that there's a few of them that are accepted. Um, something like, uh, um, Territorial behavior probably wouldn't be acceptable at a bird feeder just because you don't know if they're defending that artificial food source or if they're actually like defending from another um, neighboring individual of the same species. Um, but some of them like uh, courtship and pair bonding behaviors. Um, what else? Singing. Yeah, there's a, there's a few of them that, that are totally fine to use at, the, at your backyard feeders. All right. Um, uh, Jean is wondering, is the entire state divided into blocks? Yes, the entire state, every last corner of the state. <laughs> 
yeah, so no matter where you are in the state, you fall within a block. So wherever you live, you can, you can submit data, participate. Great. Um, Rich just wanted to double check how you find the phone app. Um, depending on if you have uh, Android, you would go to Google Play and just type in eBird. And if you're on uh, iPhone, then you would go to the App Store and type in eBird and um, it should come right up for you. Okay. All right. Sherry says, great. Um, do you have to start this year or can someone start later in the project? She said, for example, I'm still working, but plan on retiring in August 2021. Could I start then? Yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, there's no requirement to participate in all five years. You can participate as much or as little as you want. Um, yeah, you can wait until, until you have more time. Um, yeah, it's, it's totally up to you. Awesome. Okay, we definitely have some birders in the audience because we've got some specific questions. So Denise says, is singing to be broadly interpreted to include, for example, morning dove cooing? Related, the eBird app and the eBird website are different regarding whether that the bird that is singing is a male or just a singing bird. Which should we note, acknowledging that Northern Cardinals, for example, both males and females will sing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. Uh, first, the morning doves, yes, their cooing does count as singing. Um, there's a number of other species as well that count as singing. So woodpecker drumming, um, that counts as singing. Uh, some of the, the grouse drumming, um, turkey gobbling, um, woodcock painting, um, there's a rail calling, owls calling, all of that counts as singing as well. Uh, and all of that is written out on the website as well. Um, and then the second question, I hadn't realized that they hadn't changed the language on the website yet um, for singing bird versus singing male. I knew that the app had been updated uh, and that was partly because of the New York Breeding Bird Atlas and there's a bunch of people from Eber that, that are participating and um, they realized that it really didn't make sense, particularly because of Cardinal, the Cardinal example, um, it didn't make sense to say singing male and because there's a lot of species where the females will sing as well. And we're starting to learn that more and more species actually have uh, singing females than we originally thought. Uh, so they changed it just recently to singing bird. Um, so if you hear a female singing or if you, you know, if you just hear a cardinal singing and you don't see which sex it is, you can still count that as singing, uh, whether you're using the website or that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Rich is just asking for some further clarification about the app. So he's, he's saying, so just use the eBird apps. There isn't a special breeding bird atlas eBird app. Nope, there's no, no separate app. The only thing that you have to do is change the app settings to the portal. So depending on which, um, which platform you're using, um, it, it's a slightly like in the iPhone, it's down in the lower right. And then on Android, it's in the top left um, that will get you to the settings. And if you go into the settings, you'll find a portal section yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and then you'll just switch. The portal will automatically be set to core eBird. They'll just say eBird, um, but you can scroll through the list and, until you find the New York Breeding Bird Atlas. Yeah, so Dylan's walking you through it there. Um, and I do have a video on the, on the website too. So here, hang on one sec, I can, uh, I think I have. Uh, let's see. So if I go to the website and I click on about, and then I go down to uh, tutorials, facts and links. And then tutorials, you'll see here some links 
Um, and these are for, um, there's one here for setting that portal, for changing that setting. Um, so you can watch um, me, I just flip through my phone app and I've recorded my screen and talking, me talking through how to change that setting. So you can follow that and um, change it to the Atlas portal and you're, you'll be all set. Awesome, thank you. Um, Denise says, so for example, we see a house sparrow carrying nesting material nearly every day. Should we note this only the first instance or every day we see it? I'm guessing the latter, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get this question a lot. Um, so yeah, if you if you can, um, if it's not too much work for you, then, then enter it every single time you see it. So one of the things that we also hope to get out of this project is a really um, more detailed um, information about when uh, birds are breeding. Um, so what we call breeding phenology. And so knowing, you know, when they're building their nests versus raising young, um, the more data we have, the more data points we have, even if it's just the same bird in the same location, um, it still provides us valuable information to help um, fill in our, our data gaps, knowledge gaps. Okay, um, what if you are, aren't sure of a bird's identity? Do you give it your best try or not record anything? Yeah, you don't record anything if you're not sure of the identity. There are in eBird some default, um, they're not default, but like groups, you know, so if you're not sure what shore, shorebird it was, you can do shorebird spa or, um, if you're not sure if it was a hairy or a downy woodpecker, you can do hairy slash downy. Um, so there are some higher level categories that you can do in eBird. Okay, um, can you upload photos to eBird? Yes. Um, yeah, I can even show you how to do that real quick. Um, they just uh, came out with a new media upload tool. Um, just, when did they do that? November, December, something like that. Um, so you can go to any of your checklists and um, you can uh, go, you go to that checklist, you open it up on your web browser and there'll be this big button right here that says add media. And when you do that, you'll get, um, all your species down this, the left here. And you can just drag and drop your, um, bit, your photos straight over to the species and it will automatically upload it for you. Um, you can also do video and also sound recordings as well. And I would say, you know, for the, the previous question, like what if you're not sure of the species or if you're not sure of so you're not sure what behavior you observed was, you're not sure like how to code it, then the more information you provide, the more, you know, the higher the chance is that we'll be able to interpret it. So if you do have additional information, um, such as video or, or photos or even just comments, then, then do include that information. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, if you have um, the tracks turned on in eBird when you're doing a checklist, it's keeping track of your location and, and doing a track. Mm -hmm. um, but you're saying for, for the Atlas, it won't differentiate. So if your track that you're doing crosses between blocks, it, the checklist won't split automatically right. with that information. You, you have to be the one to know where that border is and stop and start restart. Exactly, yeah. Okay you need to do that. Um, and so I do show, if I just go back a little bit here, one of my other tutorials is um, to see your location against the, in relation to the block boundaries. Um, so I show you how to do that. So when you when you're, have your track and then you go to the map view um, while you're doing your checklist, you'll be able to see there's a white boundary that shows all the, the boundary, the block boundaries. And so you can check, you know, like if you're going to Visher Ferry, for example, um, it crosses, I think, three or four different blocks. 
Um, and so, yeah, you'll want to stop your checklist every time and start a new one. And then when you're in that new block, if there's no existing hotspot that, that kind of makes sense for where you're birding, you might have to create a new one. So if you're at Vischer Ferry, again, um, you know, there might be a spot that's kind of, there's a hot spot, I think, near the, near the parking lot, near the, the Whipple Bridge. Um, but if you're going to the southwest, you're going to cross several different block boundaries and there's no hot spot there. So you need to create a new one for those other blocks. Yeah. All right. That makes sense. All right, I think I've hit on all of the questions people have typed in. Um, and I was keeping an eye on Facebook to see if there was any questions there. And I think we hit them all. All right. Yeah. So thank you so much, Julie. That was excellent. Uh, gave me some, some good background. I know I, I signed up to survey. Um, my home's actually inside of a block, so I'm pretty excited. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, thank you so, so very much. Um, and thank you to everybody who attended. Um, I hope you learned something. The, the um, lecture was recorded, so it's going to be put up on our Facebook page if you want to reference it again, or if you need to copy down any of those links that Julie put up. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for your attention. And um, I hope you're excited about the atlas and birding and i know that a lot of people are kind of looking to the birds right now and to nature and to spring to to help us through this difficult time so um yeah i wish you all well and safe awesome thank you so much again julie thank you all right have a